Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Protocol Labs Research Seminar Series. Today we have Sarah Azuvi. Sarah is a consensus researcher at Protocol Labs. She gave a talk to us in February on Winkle, which is a decentralized checkpointing for proof of stake systems. Today she's going to talk to us about tools for game theoretic models of security for cryptocurrencies. Sarah, super happy to have you back. Thanks so much for giving a second talk this year. Um, go ahead and take it from here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm also very happy to be back. Um, so um, I'm going to present this work that was presented at Crypto Economic System last year, uh, 2020, and that is joint work with Alexander Higgs from UCL. So I'm going to start this talk by uh, some observation. And the observation is that Bitcoin security relies a lot um, on an economic argument. And mostly, um, Bitcoin security relies on the fact that it costs money to create a block. Um, this is the proof of work um, process that I'm sure everyone is familiar with. It takes computation and thus time and money to create a block. And also, there is some incentive reward associated with creating a block. So this is this um, uh, economy argument that really helps argue for the security of Bitcoin. And this is because it helps defense against civil attacks. So that's one of the advantage of proof of work. It's like we are uh, secure against civil attacks. An adversary could not come and just create, you know, um, as many identities as they want and create, you know, as many blocks as they want because of this. Also, it's incentivized consensus. So this is the reward that is associated with the proof of work um, that's going to help, you know, have more people uh, join, join uh, the consensus. And so uh, it is decentralized. And this is, uh, and again, like this is this incentiv incentivization that helps make it decentralized and that helps make it such that more and more people are joining the protocol, making it more secure because then an adversary that we want to, um, to attack the protocol uh, will need to, to spend more money. So the more participation they are, the more secure it is and more particip participation is achieved through um, this incentivization. So now the question that we ask is how, how do we go about proving blockchain security? And the problem that we have is that if we consider traditional distributed systems or cryptography, which are you know like the usual like big fields, they do not consider incentives. So we are like missing out on this economic argument that I've just mentioned. Um, on the other hand, we could consider game theory. Game theory is all about you know economic incentives. Uh, but on the other hand, game theory does not consider any um, any security notions. So uh, there has been you know this big, big question in the research community and community in general how to capture blockchain security. And one I've, I've knew is to somehow mix uh, game theory and security. So how do we go about this? So fortunately, uh, this has been studied a lot before Bitcoin. And so what we did in uh, that paper is that we reviewed a lot of uh, papers that have done this, exactly mix game theory and security. Uh, so this is not new work. This is like a systemat systematization of knowledge. So think of it more like as a survey and, and there is no new research in this. But maybe some research that some people have never heard about before because it wasn't within their direct field. So let me also give like a quick disclaimer is that neither this talk nor, nor our paper is exhaustive. Uh, I, we have not reviewed every paper possible that is related to game theory and security. I don't think that would be possible. Uh, so we all, only like highlighted some of uh, the one that we thought were uh, interesting in the paper. And especially in this talk, I'm not going to talk about everything that we talked about in the paper. I think that would be a bit boring. I'm going to again highlight um, the most interesting concepts and explain them. And then hopefully I will is your curiosity. And if we want to have more details, you can just go and, and read more, de more details in the paper. So now, uh, after this disclaimer, so first, why mix uh, game theory and security? Um, I mean, like for Bitcoin, I think it's quite obvious. I've explained it. But before Bitcoin, as I said, like most of the paper we reviewed, they appeared before Bitcoin. So why, why uh, people were even like doing this? 
And basically, the, the field of security economics tells us that security is about more than technical constructions. So again, if we want, if you want more details about this, we have a paper that was presented at SPW in 2018 about this that is called Incentives in Security Protocols that discuss this. Um, but for example, let me give you like a high level um, example. If you think about like chip and pin technology, so what you're going to use, um, you know, when you use your card, I think in the US they don't use it, but in Europe, when you use your card, you're going to put, you know, your chip and, and, and tap your, type your pin. And so this like technology, uh, cryptographically, they are quite secure. Um, however, there have been a lot of frauds with them. And what uh, some researchers have found out is that all the fraud and all the vulnerabilities that happened with chip and pin, they were actually due to um, like misaligned incentive and not security flow in cryptography or something like that. Like for example, um, they found out that um, uh, sometimes the bank were omitting to uh, produce like the digital signature of the card because it was cheaper to do so, or the merchants were not asking for the pin. Um, and basically, as a result, there was a lot of fraud that was going on just because um, people had no incentive to use the system correctly. So um, like basically the way to solve these uh, vulnerabilities was not with cryptography or hardware security or, links or anything else, but really um, with aligning incentive with security. Um, and so on the other hand, game theory and mechanism design, they serve to promote a good outcome. So that's um, you know, exactly what they are uh, here to help us with, like how to design a system such that people will use it in a way that is secure. So before going further, I'm going to uh, give a little uh, primer on uh, game theory and also mechanism design. I'm going to I'm going to start with game theory. So game theory, um, if you think about a, a game that is defined by uh, a set of actions and a set of um, outcome, the point of game theory is to find, uh, you know, each player best strategy, so strategy that will uh, maximize their utility. And one solution concept that is very famous within game theory is Nash equilibrium. What Nash equilibrium say is that uh, no participant can gain anything by unilaterally changing their strategy if the strategies of other players stays unchanged. So I'm sure everyone um, has, uh, has heard about it. That's very, uh, very you know, common and well used in game theory. Uh, however, um, Nash equilibrium have a lot of limitations. So, for example, they don't consider coalitions. Um, also, they don't consider irrational players. Everyone is considered, you know, rational, following some uh, predefined utility. They don't consider arbitrary faults. So, you know, that's something that, for example, we have in distributed system that some process can just like break in an arbitrary way. That's not something that is um, considered usually in game theory. They don't consider also external incentives. You know, everything is defined within the system. Um, and also, uh, I mean, there are maybe other limitations as well, but one of them is also that um, computing a Nash equilibrium is uh, not always a tractable uh, paper. There are a lot of research on this that I'm not very familiar with, but um, you, know, you should know it, that it's not actually easy to, to find uh, uh, the Nash equilibrium for a game. And lastly, but uh, importantly, uh, in game, in, yeah, in uh, game theory and also with um, Nash equilibrium, we always assume that we have some authority that is here to enforce the game and enforce the payoff. And this is something that we don't have um, by definition in distributed system or cryptography. Okay, so now let me move to uh, mechanism design. So what is mechanism design? It is a subfield of game theory that has often been referred as um, reverse game theory. And the reason why is because, um, as I've said, you know, like before, um, like the usual game theory, you start from, for, from a game that is well defined, and then you try to find, you know, what are going to be like each player strategy. In mechanism design, we start with a desired outcome. And from this, from the outcome that we want, we go on and design a game. And we want to make sure that the game that we have designed is going to lead to our desired outcome. 
So that's kind of like the opposite way of of the of the of the uh, game theory, where we start, you know, from a game and then see what is the outcome. We start from the outcome and then design the game. This is something that is uh, hard to do. I'm going to illustrate this by one example. Um, it's called the Israeli nursery study, and this is a real real life example. So in Israel, there was a nursery that had like some problems because parents were always coming late. They were always being late to pick up their child. And so what it means is that the people, you know, working from the uh, nursery, they had to stay and wait. Uh, so, so, you know, work after hours. So they were annoyed by this. So what they decided to do, they, you know, <laughs> tried to do mechanism design and they decided to uh, put a penalty fee for parents that are too late. Uh, so now every parent that pick up their child late is going to have to pay something. Now, uh, you know, we can see, you know, why they did that, because they wanted to incentivize parents to be there on time. But now what this did instead of doing that is that parents were uh, beca um, become like um, coming even, even later than before. And the way to see this is like, the parents, they saw this penalty just as a, as a way to pay for extra child care. So in the end, they felt, you know, less guilty about being late because they were paying for it. So they were like, oh, you know, why, why would I be in a hurry? So they, they became, um, they, they came later and later and later. So we see that here, this, you know, <laughs> design game design had the exact like if, uh, opposite effect intended. And also something to note is that after this, you know, they decided to remove the penalties because clearly it was not working. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't change the uh, behavior of the parents and the parents were still coming later than before. So this, you know, little anecdote to highlight like how hard it is to, um, to design uh, an instance system. And also the fact that when you do this, you can change the behavior of, the, of your system um, he irreversibly. Okay, so now that we have uh, touched on uh, on game theory and the difficulty of game theory, let's uh, talk about uh, security. So first, in security, unlike game theory, we don't consider rational players. We consider um, an adversary against like honest player. And the aim, you know, of security is to have things work. So, for example, in a distributed system, you have the property of safety and liveness, and uh, you want, you know, the system to be able to achieve this thing, even in the presence of an adversary and without a trusted third party. Okay, so why is combining security and game theory, game theory hard? hard? It is hard because we are mixing different frameworks. So it requires additional skills. Uh, it increases the overall complexity. And most importantly, it it, um, they made different assumptions. So I'm going to highlight um, this again. I have already talked about it. But in security, we consider adversary malicious players versus honest players. And in game theory, we consider rational players. So there is you know, no intersection between the two. Additionally, in game theory, we consider um, um, a trusted third party that's going to help enforce the game, which we don't consider um, in security. So um, that being said, now we're going to look at the attempts that have been made in the literature to mix uh, game theory and security. And we're going to start uh, with consensus and the attempt that have been made to uh, mix a distributed system and consensus problem with game theory. So the first uh, model that I'm going to talk about uh, related to this is the bar model. The bar model was presented by uh, Jean-Philippe Martin and his co-author. And the premise of the bar model is that we're going to consider uh, Byzantine, you know, or malicious players, altruistic player. So that's again as before. So nothing new here. And the new thing here is we're gonna have add rational players. So basically, all you know, the three three different types of players of agents. They are all you know mixing together in in this uh, framework. And in their paper, basically, they propose some you know consensus protocol that are resilient to both Byzantine and rational faults. So even if some players are, are rational, like their, um, 
consensus protocols are, are still going to achieve uh, what they want to achieve, which is secure, uh, safety and liveness. And also one uh, good thing about uh, this is that um, they, they present a model that has an unbounded number of rational users. So you know, usually in distributed system, the number of malicious players need to be bounded by one third. Uh, in that case, they don't need to bound the rational players. So that's actually quite a strong strong and nice results. So again, I'm not going to go into detail, but if you are curious, I invite you to, to look at their paper. Uh, one thing to note is that also maybe this protocol is like hard to, to apply in practice. Um, now, um, let me move on to a new concept that uh, basically refines uh, the bar model, and that's the concept of uh, robustness. So robustness, you can think about it as the extension of a Nash equilibrium that consider um, uh, also coalitions, basically. Um, so that's a system that was presented by Itai Abram and his co-author. And, um, and, you know, basically they, they just like define a Nash equilibrium, but extend it to the case of uh, also like malicious users and coalitions. So that's also like a nice paper that I invite you to look at, but something to uh, note here is that in their definition of robustness, they consider um, Byzantine players and rational player differently. So the two are not uh, like independently, the two are not considered uh, dependently. So that's also like one of the, one of the drawbacks of this, of this concept. So that was mostly some uh, concepts that were presented in the field of distributed system. Now I'm going to move on and, um, and talk about uh, some, some concept of cryptography. Um, and what I mean is like uh, cryptography mixing game theory. So that's also a problem that most, that's a lot of cryptographers have been interested in well before Bitcoin. I'm going to start by uh, introducing one um, like subfield of cryptography that is called rational cryptography. As the name suggests, it's... Um, the, the, the theme of it is to um, have cryptography, but with rational agents. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on one particular concept, which is rational protocol design. And um, rational protocol design. So how does it work? So basically, it works by having a meta game between a protocol designer on one side and an adversary on the other side. And the idea is that the protocol designer will send uh, the protocol that they have designed to the adversary, and the adversary will reply back with an attack on the protocol. So for those of you who are not familiar, that's like the normal game-based security. That's you know, how security is defined in, in, in some context in cryptography. Now, the difference in uh, rational protocol design is that the adversary will not be a fully malicious adversary, but instead it will be a rational adversary. And so what it means is that when we consider this model, the protocol pi that the protocol designer is sending to the adversary can have some vulnerabilities. And the idea is that the protocol will be considered secure um, if the adversary cannot exploit this vulnerability by making a, uh, a profit. So that's very interesting because it means that According to this definition, some protocol that were not initially secure can now be defined secure as long as the adversary does not gain anything by exploiting the protocol. So for example, the adversary will lose money by uh, exploiting the protocol. So again, that's a quite very, very nice concept. And especially something that we note is like by adopting this definition, we are allowed to um, bypass some impossibility results. So some problems that have been shown to be impossible to solve, actually, by considering this rational adversary, could be um, solvable as long as the adversary cannot gain anything by exploiting um, any vulnerability. So very interesting model. Again, if you are interested, um, you can um, have a look at the paper. There are references about this. And um, one maybe drawback that I'm going to mention here is like, so this paper, also, although very nice, they don't consider a fully malicious adversary and just a rational adversary. So it's not like complete. We don't, um, you know, there could be some complete, um, completely malicious um, 
adversary out there that are ready to attack a protocol, even if it means like losing money. So they only consider one part, uh, one part of this problem. Okay, so now that I have introduced um, all these uh, problems, um, you know, the distributed system and game theory, and then cryptography and game theory that were mixed together, um, let's discuss about how this uh, relates back to blockchain. So first, in um, in the subfield of you know consensus, uh, something to know is like, for example, the bar model, which I have discussed, and also the rational protocol design. Both of them they have been actually applied to a blockchain consensus and to a Bitcoin. However, um, they they haven't been widely adopted by the community, and you will notice that a lot of paper that propose blockchain consensus protocol, they will usually like leave aside the, the um, incentive uh, analysis. So there, there isn't uh, quite yet a model uh, that incorporates incentives and uh, security that has been adopted by the community. Um, and then there's also the problem of decentralization, you know, that I've mentioned at the very beginning of my talk about the fact that um, incentivizing more people to join made the protocol more secure because it means there were, uh, were there was more power in the in the um, total network. So that's something that is like very specific to Bitcoin. And it's not something that has been also like widely uh, studied. Um, there exists some empirical work about this that kind of like measure the decentralization of Bitcoin and Ethereum and uh, quantify how decentralized or centralized they are. There is uh, some theoretical work that uh, has started to appear about uh, decentralization. But uh, that's also another uh, problem of uh, blockchains that isn't really uh, considered by many uh, protocol designers. So most paper that will um, that will propose some um, some some consensus protocols for blockchain, they will not also have like a, a, a full you know theoretical analysis of decentralization because there is no model um, widely adopted for this. Okay, so now we are uh, getting closer to the end of the talk. So I'm gonna uh, finish with some open problem. Um, so maybe you are, you know, curious, and we can discuss this. Um, so first one is that utilities are hard to compute in practice. So as I said, um, as I've mentioned before, um, in you know, in general, in game theory, we don't really like consider external incentives. We just define like incentives within the system. And I think that every paper that has come and tried to combine game theory with distributed system or security, like they have done the same, you know, like keep the incentive like within the, the, the well-defined systems. And especially now with all the ecosystem of blockchains, all the new consensus protocol, etc. There are a lot of external incentives that have yet to be captured by protocol designer. Um, also, most of the uh, research is theoretical, and uh, we know that sometimes um, that's something that has been reproached, for example, in the field of economy, where a lot of models were not con consistent with like real world data. So it's nice to have all this model, but also it would be interesting to have some empirical data on the behavior of players and um, coalitions so that we can really understand what are those uh, incentives and what are the actual utilities of the player. So, for example, there's a lot of, um, of discussion, I mean, some discussion that has been going around about um, um, long-term incentives versus short-term incentives. Uh, there are a lot of attacks, for example, like short-term incentives attacks that exist on Bitcoin that or any other, you know, proof-of-work currency that have yet to be, um, to be used in practice or at least observed in practice. And some arguments against this could be that um, miners also have long-term incentives in the game, so they don't really have any incentive to attack the system. So there are you know, a lot of um, difficulty when uh, designing this utilities function. So I hope this um, has teased your security about all the work that exists uh, at the intersection of game theory and security. And uh, again, I, I think you should, if you're curious, you should maybe go and have a look at the paper so you can see like other concepts and maybe some concepts with more details. And then 
refer to the paper and uh, I would be very happy to take some question or even discuss discuss this with with other people <laughs> at some point in the future. Sarah, thanks for, for the talks. Really, really nice, really interesting. Um, maybe you said that and I missed it, I'm not sure. But um, what's the difference between the bar model and the rational cryptography? What's like the main difference there? Um, and can I say that if you take bar with zero malicious is like the rational cryptography model? You know? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, actually, I think that's a good, that's a, that's, that's a very good point because indeed, so bar they consider, you know, like the three type of players, whereas um, rational cryptography they don't consider like fully malicious, so they consider only rational. So indeed, if you take bar but remove the fully malicious, then they are kind of like equivalent, except that bar it was defined in the context of distributed system. Whereas rational, uh, so, so like they don't really consider any like game, they consider just like safety and liveness. Whereas rational cryptography it was really defined in this, like this meta game. So you really have the game between like the protocol designer and the adversary. So um, also in it's like in assumptions, they are different, but also in how they define security, one is distributed system and one is game-based cryptography. Okay, but, uh, mm -hmm. okay, I see, I see, and and so the the rational cryptography maybe is more like uh, user than easier to use for two players protocol instead of multiplayer. So maybe mm -hmm. also or not, not really. N not necessarily because here it's a two player game, but like between the protocol designer and the adversary. So actually the protocol designer could have a game with like N parties and that would okay. that would work as well. So, um, so that- It can I, be generalized to yeah, any player. Yeah, yeah, actually like it's a two player game, but then the N player case is like considered inside the protocol pie. So the, so the game designer which design a game for N player, that the adversary will try to attack. I see. That makes sense. I see. Yeah. Thank you. No yeah, yeah. Thanks. You previewed some open problems at the end of your talk. Are any of those ones that you are actively engaged in? I know you said you had a couple publications submitted at the moment as well. Um, actually, yes, some, one of them is indeed related and especially, um, I discussed, you know, the problem of like decentralization and how to like formally define decentralization. So that's actually one of the, um, like, uh, well, at least I, I, I touched some aspect of this, maybe not, not the whole problem of defining decentralization, but some problem of yeah, formalizing some part of uh, decentralization. That's one of my next question. Yes. So yeah, and, uh, and I'm interested in all of them. So I would be, I would be happy to, to discuss it with anyone who also has some interest. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I am working on on this problem of um, of decentralization and and defining incentives within decentralization. A uh, question in the chat about uh, your thoughts on this type of research moving into applied questions about game theory and security. Um, uh, so how to go from this from the theory to to the applied? Well, I to be fair, like I think there, I think actually maybe most of the I feel like now it's going the other way around. Like maybe like people are doing like some like measurements and things like that. So we have some idea of like what we observe, but we haven't done the model that's fits those observations. So I feel that actually maybe the research is going, um, yeah, maybe both ways actually. But yeah, they, 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 they are, there, there is more and more coming. So both on the applied and theoretical side, but I think now the problem also will be to, how, and this I don't have the answer, but how do we, are, how are we gonna reach consensus on like a model and how are we gonna get a model that is like adopted by everyone? Um, I'm not sure how that's gonna work, but that's definitely something that's gonna be interesting, interesting to observe um, what people decide to use as model. And um, that's quite interesting. Thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. <laughs> really appreciate you taking the time to give this talk. And thank you everyone else for joining. Our next talk is next week, which is May 11th at 1700 UTC. We have Nick Spooner 
who is a postdoctoral researcher at Boston University, talking to us about post-quantum succinct arguments. If you are not on our mailing list, please sign up in the footer at research.protocol.ai. You can specify what types of emails you would like to receive. We send out monthly talk previews, quarterly newsletters, and information on research funding opportunities. If you have a speaker or topic suggestion for a future talk, please email us at research.protocol.ai. Thanks for joining, everyone. We'll see you next time.